Great. So, praise the Lord. So, it, it's so wonderful to be a child of God. And if you can believe it, He chose us because of our need. And yes, He made us in His image and He would like to polish up that image by the work that He's doing in, his, in these days on the earth. So, um, this morning, you probably think that's the weirdest title you've ever heard for a a, a keynote session, pulling your kids out from the fire, that's taken from scripture and we'll get into that right away, but we're gonna talk about ambition. Been doing this 35 years. And, and Becky's been with us 31 years. And you know what? We started saying this 35 years ago and it hasn't changed. The ambitions that you bring into your home affect your children for their lifetime. And the only ambition that has any eternal scope and sequence is our salvation, is our redemption in Jesus. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time this morning sharpening that focus. And I have from, from Jude, you're familiar with the passage, Jude uh, verses 20 to 23. Um, quick thought, you have to prepare yourself continually to be the Lord's servant in your home. That is, by your human, natural, fleshly nature, you're not spiritual. So you have to take the time to tune in. Man has a spirit, and man has a mind. And man usually operates out of his mind. But man's spirit doesn't have the capacity to comprehend eternal things until his spirit is ministered to by the Holy Spirit. So Jude just gave a really simple formula. Go through it really quickly. He said, build yourself up in your most holy faith. What does that mean? David's men were getting ready to stone him at Ziklag because the leadership decision he made caused all of the men to be away with their arms and a band from another town came and captured all their wives and their children and their goods. And everybody was upset. David was the one that was blamed and they were getting ready to stone him. And the scripture says, but David comforted himself in the Lord. And then he had a plan. So you and I daily, so do you have stressful days? Do you have stressful issues? Wonderful. Wow, that means that before you got up, God created for you direct opportunities for that spiritual engagement to occur in your life and in your home. So you need to build yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, your mind might multiply your fears, but the fears that we have must be either abated and assuaged by the Holy Spirit, giving us the heavenly perspective, and what's the heavenly perspective, point three, anticipating the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that brings eternal life. Did you know that's the only way you can cover it yourself in any matter? And it's rather practical. Here you are in the immediate circumstance of a difficulty, and it might be even rather terrifying. But as you go about to prepare yourself, the first part of that verse says, dear friends, maintain yourselves in the love of God by building up your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. So you have to pause and think, okay, wait a minute. When eternity sets in, what's this gonna, account for. And the only thing that anything is going to account for is that preparation for eternity so that we'll be able to reflect our, our brother Savior Jesus in the way that God intended us to. Continuing, so I'm going to have to hurry, I apologize, but let's keep going. So the next part then, uh, it says, love the sinner, hate the sin. Now, you've heard that little cliche before, but that's exactly what Jude is saying. And he has three little snapshots here, and I, it may be progressive. The first little snippet is, have mercy on those who waver. So usually wavering is related to faith. Whatever's not of faith is sin, so when you're wavering, the whole approach of mercy is uh, they're struggling. Now, what I really don't want us to miss today is that the things that usually 
cause us the most tension and maybe irritation, uh, aggravation, the, the needs of our kids and their sin nature being expressed rather eloquently. And we can easily take it personally and begin to respond out of frustration, human frustration. But Jude gives us this little different approach. Have mercy on those that are wavering. When you're in the middle of a situation, are you able to spot your child's struggle with faith in that instant? That's your job. That's your privileged ministry. What is it about faith right now that you're struggling with? Well, what about God can't you trust right now? Now, as we go through this, you know what you're going to have? Your, your response is going to be, but I'm sorry. I'm just way too busy. And there's so much work to get done, and I just don't have time for this. Well, you don't have time not to do this because this gives you perspective and, uh, and assists you in how you go forward. So the second point is save others snatching them out of the fire. Now, I don't exactly know what that means in terms of every particular situation, but I know that the, the graphic is it's assuming that you've dealt with the fire before. And when something falls in the fire of value, you, with high speed, quickly snatch it out and try to quench the flames to preserve it, to protect it from being damaged by the fire. That's the imagery that's projected here. And so there's that sense of urgency to help capture right before you fall in. And that's a part of the approach. So you have wavering faith and you have kids falling into the fire, as it were. <clears throat> and thirdly, have mercies on others, coupled with the fear of God, hating even the clothes spotted by the flesh. Now that, that's a difficult one, but I want you to understand this concept of fear of God. <clears throat> it's an incredible thought. So in Hebrews 5, the, the scripture says that Jesus, in the days of his flesh, cried out to God with loud cries and tears. And God heard him in that he feared. Same word. And this is an eloquent type of fear because what it means is simply this. In the middle of a very intense situation, which way you're going to go and how you pass judgment, it's very fragile. And being able at that moment to recognize, you know what, at this, at this moment, God, I want what you have for me above all else. Not my will, but thine be done. And there's that fragile fear of God being, being yours as a heritage of faith. And that's, and that's our object. So we tend to want to avoid these kinds of circumstances, but your children are either going to be wavering, needing to be snatched from the fire, or they're going to need a kind of mercy that is coupled with the fear of God. And notice how coupling with the fear of God is combined with hating even the clothes stained by the flesh. What that's implying is this. You, you love the sinner and you hate the sin. And, and it gets very difficult. It gets very difficult and as a parent in the middle of a circumstance to not make the child feel hated. It's very difficult to, for a child not to feel that way. But, but for you and I, the visionary reality can be that we see the redemptive opportunity that we're in the middle of. And we want that purpose of God to come through. You know, you don't ever want one of your children to stumble and fall and have something huge happen to them. But it happens. And so in that process, your, your life isn't over. You're not marked forever as the worst parent to live the face of the earth. You're at a stage where now your, your mode of operation has to be, I'm going to bring the mercy of God coupled with fear. I'm not gonna do anything that would change the holiness of God. So I'm, I'm going to hate even the clothes spotted by the flesh. Now that's, that's pretty tough because we live in a culture today where uh, we don't really hate anything. And that kind of, we're, we're, we're rather uh, comfortable with uh, the accoutrements 
and the outfits, as it were, of the flesh. I'll leave that for some more conversation later. So the big question is, Harvard or heaven? Now, I used Harvard because it had an H. And if heaven was spelled with a Y, I would have said Yale or Yevon. But it doesn't, so I said Harvard. So, but I, I've been doing this 35 years. And all of us parents want, want our children to be able to reflect 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 11 and 12, where our children step out into the marketplace of this world and the world looks up on them and they see a visible faith in a practical working out of that faith, taking responsibility for oneself. In fact, that's the whole premise that I felt comfortable founding an educational program on the scripture because the so-called purpose of compulsory attendance being that the state doesn't have the ability if the whole entire population fell on the state to support it because children couldn't grow up and take care of themselves, that would be totally inappropriate. Well, the Bible teaches that for Christians right off. I want my children to lead a quiet life, mind their own business, work with their hands, so they have a testimony with those that are outside, and that they're not lacking in anything. That's the goal, that's the objective. So, so on the screen, I wanna just, this is real quick as we're going through this, but there's this little, oh, so upfront snippet. So our main focus today is Matthew 18. And to kind of set you up, if I said to you, Matthew 18, I don't have time, so I'm not gonna give mics and let you tell me your wrong answer. But if I, if I, if I said Matthew 18, said, what do you think of you think of Matthew 18? And people usually read it, say church discipline. And the, the essence of church discipline that they think they're ascribing from Matthew 18 is you kick them out of the church. So they get punished. And there's a, what do you call it, this painful what do you, we, um, shunning going on. Well, we're going to go through some of this study. It's exciting. But Matthew 18, that's how the human spirit reads it. But that is not what Matthew 18 is about. So Matthew, the whole discussion Matthew 18 generates when the disciples come and they want to go to Harvard. I see some of you looking at me like, what? Harvard didn't even exist back then. Okay, speaking in word pictures, okay, illustration. They wanted to be great. They wanted to be famous. And they came and asked, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? I, I, I want to be great. When I was in seventh grade, I raised my hand in religion class. And I said to the teacher, how can I be a saint? I want to be a saint. And it was an ambition. And of course, in the religion I was brought up in, very few people ever get to be saints. And I was told very kindly by the teacher, I'm sorry, it's impossible to become a saint. You'll never be one. Sit down. <laughs> but we all want to be great and famous. And Jesus called a little child, placed him among them, and builds the whole case for our, for our discussion today. So I have three quick things I want you to think about as we go forward. Number one, disciple of Jesus cannot let his personal ambitions run unchecked. I've been a parent long enough and I've seen other parents long enough and it is like the most shocking thing as a pastor for me is the enormous amount of church strife of church splits. I mean, this is going to sound horrible, but it's, the, it's my observation. There's more energy put into a parent's processing of what is my family going to get out of it, and especially what are my kids going to get out of it, than in any other measure for going to church. Now, I realize that's the nature of the human spirit, but it's, it's not a spiritual focus. And it is deadly. It is deadly spiritually. If, if you think that that ambition to get your child well pleased in whatever circumstances, your primary goal for participating in the church, you're really in serious confusion and trouble. 
You just can't allow it. <clears throat> Being the <laughs> charge of the school in the early years, I called Becky. Ding a ling a ling. Hi, Becky. This is Gary. Um, <clears throat> I have a little question here, but um, you know, I'm just feeling a little tense. You know, as, as the school's growing, I'm, I'm noticing that certain families are like really wanting a lot of personal time with with my family, and you know, and they're all over the state. And I just, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to shut people out, but I'm limited. You know, I'm only one person. And uh, Becky said, well, do they happen to have daughters the age of your son? I said, well, yeah, what does that have to do with it? Well, it has everything to do with it. And she went on to counsel me. That's the unfortunate way it is. The uh, attraction of what you got for what I might get. And that, you know, I just, I thought Becky was so unspiritual. That was so scandalous to hear that from her. <laughs> But it's true, it's so true. We get so shallow. I, I had a parent once call me and said, I'm looking for special friends for my daughter. So I'm picking your daughter. May I pick your daughter as a special friend for my daughter? I said, well, what do you have in mind by that? What's that gonna look like? Well, it's going to look like this, that, and the other. And I said, well, Probably the only way you can get that kind of access is if, if you were in our church and you know you hung around us everything. But you know, I, I don't don't take this wrong. I'm not trying to be rude, but it's not appropriate for me to single you out as a special recipient of of our family's love. I mean, we love everybody, and we're going to minister to everybody, but uh, it's not it's not appropriate. So no, you can't be a special friend. And that was hard, and I was mean, and it was, you know, scary Gary does it again. But, you know, it's, it's so imperative to understand. Second point is a parent gospel-focused ministry is the heavenly purpose. If you don't have heaven in view with everything you do, you're simply piddling around in something that's not going to last forever. And you're wasting your time and your resources, and you may be putting your children at risk beyond being recovered. Thirdly, ambitious parenting needs to be abandoned. So let's go forward in how to do that. So redemption is the true object of greatness, and that's what parenting's all about. Parenting is not about getting your kid into Harvard, and homeschooling isn't about getting your children into Harvard. There's a simple, singular reality. Jesus made this promise, Sermon on the Mount. You seek the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God and his righteousness, and unlike the Gentiles who worry to death about these things and they structure their whole life about the hankering and the struggle and the competition to get there, um, I know what needs you have and I'll take care of them. And quite frankly, if the father believes that his greatest glory is going to occur by your kid being in Harvard, nobody's going to keep him out of Harvard. It's not your responsibility to have the dream and the vision and the scope and the sequence and the plan and the boom. It's not your responsibility. The Father said, seek the kingdom of God. Seek his righteousness. And I'll add these other things as time goes on. And it's true. And it's true. Being faithful in little things puts you in a position where you wouldn't have been if you weren't being faithful. And being in that position, the tap on the shoulder comes at the most unexpected time for God to use you for his glory. So, I want to start with the obvious, but every parent needs conversion. You, mom, you, dad, must be born again. And if you think that you can raise a heavenly troop for God, existentially, without you being a child of God, it's just not going to ever happen. You're never, it's never going to cross your mind what to do right. Did you hear that? It is never going to cross your mind one time, what to do right as it relates for building an eternal inheritance for your kids. Eyes not seen, ear not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But they're revealed to us by a spirit. So our spirit connected with the Holy Spirit, the word of God, we get 
an outlook for eternity that's not coddling to or comparing to or enjoying this world's idea of success or glamour. So as he begins this little comment here in verse 3 to 5, Jesus tells you and I that we have to become like little children. Now, as we go forward, two attitudes of successful nurturing. When I was meeting with Becky recently, she had this burst. I hope she remembers to share it because it was what she's preparing for today. But it was just so precious, the, just the uh, spiritually emotional realization, again, afresh. What a privilege homeschooling is where I have that time continually day after day to thoughtfully care and nurture, for my, nurture my children. And to a fault it might look like, it, it sounds like we're disregarding things that are academic, but, but the reality is this. If I've got a child in love with God, if I've got a child panting after God, child happens to be made in the image of God, God knows him better than anybody else. God knows how he wants to use him better than anybody else. And so I can trust God to open doors. And I know this was a long, long time ago, but we'd homeschooled one year, and I wasn't sure if we should quit. And the main reason I was thinking we should quit was because I realized that we're not very smart and we're not going to have the best academic program. And if the primary purpose of us homeschooling was a great academic program, we better hurry back to the school because we weren't going to match them. And the Lord allowed me to just take a quick look at Luke, just to think about the most famous person ever walked the face of the earth, ever stepped one foot inside an institution. And the scripture says in Luke 2, and Jesus went home and was subject to his parents. And he grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and favor with man. And in Jesus' case, he began to be about 30 years old before he left home. But it was a, it was a center that God had of nurture. And he learned what was in that home. He became a carpenter. That's what his dad was. And that's the wonderful thing that we can do. We can share fully who we are. That's the heritage. And God knows how to build off on that. If your child learns how to learn one thing, then they can learn anything. And it's not a question of if they can learn. It's a question of the primary things that they might ought to learn that God will prepare for them. So we need two things. Scripture here in Matthew 18 requires of us personal humility and a welcoming spirit towards our children. Our culture doesn't allow for either. Our culture is a huge competition of being somebody, being noted, being well noted, being loved, being well loved. And I'm sorry, but I'm busy. I don't have time for you. I've got only time for me. So I don't have a very welcoming spirit. Let me illustrate the welcoming spirit. A little illustration happened. It was our first year homeschooling. And the Walkersville office was in our home. I guess it was our second year homeschooling. The Walkersville office was in our home at the time. And I had a little office that was double secluded, had two doors, bathroom in between, so I could go in there and lock my door and have, have my office away from. And I had a brand new toddler. And I'd go in and close my door and start working. And I would this little child knocking. It was my son. Wanted in. It wouldn't stop knocking. I had two choices. Go in, don't bother me. I'm busy. Or open the door. So I opened the door. But that barrier of having closed the door created so much insecurity that just opening the door wasn't enough. I had to sit in my lap. And not only did he have to sit in my lap, he had to be the main thing about the main thing. I had a piece of paper and a pen, and he wanted my paper and my pen. So I realized, well, I can't surrender my paper and my pen because I do need to get some work done. But I had to provide him his paper and his pen. Okay, you can have the left knee, I'll use the right knee. And I just hugged him tight. And it was the strangest thing that happened. The security that flowed through his little being. In a few minutes, he realized 
that is squishy. I need more space. So he hopped off my knee and got on the floor with his pen and paper, but he was still near. And the, the level of comfort security reached a significant enough point. He left the room. And you know what I did? I closed the door. <laughs> you know what he did? <laughs> and I realized I have to have my door open and I have to be accessible. I have to have a welcoming spirit for my son. It's just required. Now, <sighs> holiness. You've heard the scripture say, be holy for I'm holy. And it's hard. I, I did a study this week on it. There's, how many times does the King James word holy appear in the Bible? 544 times. And the word holiness, which is a different rendition of the same word, appears about 43 times. So I looked up and copied down everyone, read everyone, and it was interesting. And of all those 544, some, the vast majority were instruments in the Old Testament that taught the children of Israel that you approach God in holiness. You had a holy robe. You had a holy room. You had a holy priest. You had a holy sacrifice. You had a holy incense. You had a holy oil. And the word holy primarily means to be set apart exclusively for God's purpose. That's what it means. So, in my frustration, I'm like thinking, okay, but that doesn't help me be holy today. I mean, yeah, the Old Testament, those sacrifices are gone, but you know, we are sinners. And then I came across this one, one of the holies, Isaiah 57. There's a few more verses like this in the Psalms, etc. For thus say the high, the, for thus says the high and lofty one. that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in a high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and a humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. See, what we'll never really fully master, especially because of Satan's treachery, is the, the best place to have the holy God is in our hearts. And he comes to the contrite and to the broken. Now, your contrition is an expression of I'm sorry I did this. I, this, isn't, this isn't what I want to do. It's an acknowledgement that I'm broken. And, and a broken spirit is to recognize that you have no power. You want to do better and you have no way to do it. And you're totally helpless. And so we have a high and holy God and he only dwells with that kind of person. Now, now if you and I caught the vision for that, you know what that would make us? That would make us warriors for nurturing the broken fallenness of each child so that the high and holy God would, would come and be a part of their life. So as we go through the rest of Matthew 18, there's some real simple instruction and, and you might say, well, I'm taking liberty, but I'm just trying to get through the application and I'll let you worry about if I took liberty. Parenting requires personal humility so that you and I must become like a little child. A child trusts implicitly, has no grandiose ambitions. And, and you know what, I, I just wanna say your Harvard ambitions can't be eliminated until you have a childlike expectation. Isn't it, isn't it okay? Did you hear that your best friend was just appointed to some really significant post in the government? He was picked out. Now, think about yourself. What a fool you are. What a dumb wit you are. Nobody's ever picked you for basket weaver. 
So it's so naturally easy for us to fall into this pit of glamour pursuit, where I want to be something, I want to be somebody. And we get all caught up in it. But you know, when you're there with your Heavenly Father, and He's dwelling with you and the fullness of His love is saturating your being, you know, it's so easy to say, Lord, Lord I'm yours, and you can do with me as you see fit. If, if you wish to just snuff me out in some act of wonderful glory, it's going to be amazing what you do with it. I'm yours. Do with me what you want. And see, until you have an ambition that says, do with me what you want, that's that fragile humility. Thy will, not mine, be done. Until you have that, then, then you're going to be pressed. You're going to be oppressed because of that Gentile nature to accomplish something in the world, to be somebody, and to take, to take that responsibility and burden on yourself. So as the disciples were fighting over it, <clears throat> these two attitudes come to bear, a humble heart and a welcoming spirit. So I'm sure if every one of you had Jesus email you, hey, can I come over tonight? You, know, you, you, you might be bold enough to say, could you do it tomorrow so I can get the house clean? <laughs> but you would love to welcome Jesus into your life. And Jesus wants us to understand that it's the welcoming of those helpless, needy ones that welcomes Jesus. And that's our first and foremost objective. But what an incredible privilege we have as parents. Not only is it a privilege as parents to be parents, but with the, the blessing of an opportunity of homeschooling, we can take a so much larger segment of time for that kind of care and nurture, dealing with what really, really, really matters. <clears throat> the text says on the screen from Matthew 18, and whoever welcomes a child like this in my name welcomes me, but if anyone causes one of these little ones that believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a huge millstone hung around his neck to be drowned in the open sea. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Now that's a warning to you and I. We're parents and we cause our children to stumble often. Uh, that's, that's partly where the contrite heart and broken spirit begins with ourselves. Because that's the only way to bring God into the formula. We are so broken, we are so needy, and be, be so ever quick about confessing your fault. So stumbling blocks are not welcome mats for holiness. Stumbling blocks are barriers. And uh, this l the little statement that I have on the screen says this, failure to gauge the impact of my actions and how they may affect my children is the heart of an unwelcoming spirit. I really, really need to be thoughtful. Now dads, husbands, I wanna say something. There's a, there's a giftedness that God gave your wife way back at Genesis 3.16. The sensitivity that your wife has for the well-being and the wholeness of family, and it's just there. And, and you and I need to, with spiritual wisdom, deal with it, learn how to deal with it. But reality is, I have to pay attention to the impact I have. Sometimes we get so monolithic in our thought that we just imagine, you know what? I'm the boss and they better obey and that's all that there is to it. No, it isn't all there is to it. <laughs> uh, God's the boss and you're a servant and he's watching. Look at the bottom of the screen. <laughs> You're being held accountable. See that you do not stain one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. So, um, children have hope. Your parents are not actually autocratic. They might pretend to be, try to be, but they're not capable of being. You have a heavenly father, and you can appeal to him directly, and he has angels watching over you. And you can ask for help. But the warning is to us who are the caregivers, uh, say that you don't disdain. 
Now, what do you mean, how do you disdain a little one? Here's how you disdain a little one. <clears throat> Disdain's a strong word, and the emotion of it is huge. And if you ever fall into disdain, uh, it's imperative that you remedy it with repentance and brokenness. But, but the stain starts at just devaluing some other person's situation and circumstances as not nearly as important because you're so important, what you're doing is so huge that this can't matter. Now, I'm not saying that the first thing that comes into your head, you mean so the littlest tiny thing somebody has, I have to drop everything and take care of the littlest tiny thing? No, the, the, the biggest reality is not to disdain so that when you see a little thing for a little one, always remember, if they win a victory of faith in a little matter now, it's gonna strengthen, build their faith. And the next time, it's gonna be a bigger act of faith. And maybe one day your child's gonna come to you and say, Dad, I need some prayer, I need some help. I've got a teacher at college that's really aggressive uh, with inappropriate lifestyle and I'm just trying to discern how to be a witness and how to be, uh, how to be loving. And, and you'll be there for every step of faith. But disdain meanings, means that, that we don't value what's taking place, what's going on right at the moment. And, and it's imperative that we pay attention. A child's faith wavering, okay, what are you looking for? Are you just looking for a smooth flow, neat house, uh, you know, shiny kids so people can say, oh wow, your kids are so good. Is that what you're looking for? Because that's like so shallow and it's, it's an imperfect, anytime somebody compliments your kids, say, you don't have a clue. I have a house full of sinners. And we're, and we're struggling by the grace of God with that great Redeemer who's fixing us every day, but we're all broken like everybody else. Now, I'm going to make it. So there's three elements of redemptive care that come out of Matthew 18 that I want to draw your attention to. I use three simple words, snatching, confronting, and forgiving. Now, verse 12 to 14 is the snatching. Snatch your loved ones from the fire. Go after their battles with sin. And it's a familiar story of someone who owns a hundred sheep and one goes astray. And you leave the 99 on the mountain and go look for the one that went astray. And you find it. And it says here, if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he'll rejoice more over it than the 99 that did not go astray. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that one of these little ones should be lost. Now, you know what that's telling me? You know what that's telling us? The center focus of care at any given point in your home ought to be the child with the greatest need of the hour. And you might even have one child that needs a lot more care in these ways than others. But Proverbs did tell us that if you properly take care of this lost sheep, then the other children watching are gonna learn something. They're, they're gonna figure some things out, and so you're ministering to the whole. But, you know, there's a, there's a little flaw, you know, you probably heard the, the exhortation, be sure you date every child, and date your wife, and, you know, set all these high standards for things that you gotta do. Well, you know, when, when you get a lot of kids, it starts to be a little bit impractical. And I don't mind anybody that has that um, blessing that can do, you know, special times or what have you. But what you really need to understand is if you're on the lookout, the date goes out the window. The 99 have to stay in the pasture. Sorry, I got to find that sheep. There's an investment in the lost soul. Now, I, I do want to assure you that in your home, you will not find 99 sheep that didn't go astray. <laughs> <laughs> I 
because my Bible tells me that all, leave, all we like sheep have gone astray. So there's, there's a little bit of loss here. I mean, it's an illustration that, yes, if you got one out of the fold, you're going to go after it. But you're going to have all your kids out of the fold at some point. We're born out of the fold. We're born bent wrong. And so you have to go after that child. And I just, you know, I want to say categorically, and then you're going to have to deal with it practically back in your home. But categorically, nurturing your children for heaven is more important than any other assignment, period. And what happens is you disdain your children's spiritual needs when you start having other agendas that push aside caring for that child in their need. And you don't provide the time that they need, you're, you're relegating them to the ranks of the dung, be dumb, dung heap. You're, you're disdaining them. You know, just get with the vision. God gave you needy children so that he could use you as an under-shepherd to lead them to him so that their gifts and who they really are can be drawn out by the grace of God and they can glorify him in the world like God intends them to in a unique, particular way. That's the plan. That's the purpose. Now, I had a story to tell about snatching out of the fire, but I forgot it, so we'll go forward. If it comes back to me, I'll tell you. Second point, limit confrontation to three distinct sections sessions. This is something brand new for me in terms of understanding. I wish I had understood this as a parent long years ago, but the Lord helped me. When I started out parenting, I had the imagination that I had to go to the death with every confrontation with a child. You know, you're going to Break their will, but not their spirit, but, but you're going to win. I had a false expectation that no confrontation with a child was ever, ever going to not happen. I was going to... But when we moved to Frederick, my oldest child was only turning three, and a, a newspaper article came out about a Christian couple living in a little compound, a little, you know, five families in a little home in Hagerstown area. And a five-year-old boy was spanked to death. He wasn't beat to death. He was spanked to death. And so the Lord gave me counsel with that, you know, that's not what God meant. So even though I was likely to be that kind of parent that wasn't going to give up the battle till I won, that hearing that story really seasoned me. But today, I have enthusiasm to teach you from the scripture what the principle is. And let me couch the nature of the principle. The nature of the principle is such that you always need to be a free agent for God. And if you're always going to be a free agent for God, it means you're always going to be ready and at, at, at the ready to serve his interests. But you're not God. And there are people that you're going to minister and care to that you're going to reach your limit as much as lies within you, be at peace with all men. Amen. There's a limit. So the picture here shown, <laughs> three distinct sessions. If your brother sins against you, show him his fault. Now, this is where even my Bible has it printed, church discipline. So I realize I might be the only person in the history of Christianity that doesn't agree, but that's not church discipline. It's not church discipline. And if you catch the spirit of this, this is how you do disciplining in your home. So here's what happens. There's an engagement, a deliberate engagement, because if you save a sinner from hell, you, you redeem a soul. So, so there's, a, there's a benefit, and you want to go after the target. And the picture is, is threefold. And if you look at it in simplicity, this is actually how you handle personal grudges in your own life. Somebody sins against you, you go to them, and then they don't agree or they won't repent. Then you get some witnesses and you go. Now, part of the problem, so you establish every word, part of the problem with witnesses is also then you have to be telling the story and hearing the other side. And in the middle of it, you may be the one that's the rascal. And you may be the one that needs to repent. So that's that nature of nurture, care, and forgiveness. And then if they won't hear that 
set of witnesses, they bring it to the church. Now the word here just means the group, the assembly. They didn't actually have church at the time Jesus had. They had if he had meant it that way, they said synagogue, but anyway. So you bring it to the church, to the group, and then you present it to the group. But let's just put this in, in, the, in the mind of um, parenting. Let's, let's say you have a hard-nosed, stubborn child, and they're not responding. So, so let's set the structure really, really quickly. The structure is the child, as a parent, you're going to privately, alone with the child, go to the child and show them the fault. Now, right there, that eliminates 98% of bad parenting. Because most of the time, bad parenting starts with an immediate reaction in public to what a kid's doing because I'm embarrassed and ashamed and I sit in the process of hauling off and hollering at my kid or whatever I do. But see, if your goal is redemptive, then you realize how huge this is and you don't disdain the necessity of taking the time to do it right. You don't disdain that. And so you go to the child alone and one-on-one. -on -one. And yeah, how you do it involves lots of skills and little things and each child might be a little bit different, but you might say to the child something like, um, um, do you have any idea why mommy or daddy has brought you aside? There's something that they draw your attention. Do you have any idea what it is? They might right away know. They might not. And so you say, well, um, such and such and so and so and this and that and the other and this is what happened. Now, the child may deny it. No, it didn't happen. That way. It wasn't true. Now, at this point, in parental discipline, if you are using corporal punishment like we did, carefully, uh, it may be appropriate to say, well, I need to bring the loving wisdom of God in chastising you because I want you to understand that in the very end, you're going to stand before God and you're not going to give an argument. You're going to give in. There's an almighty God in heaven, so I want you to learn that. So we, the wisdom, the rod begins the wisdom, listening. But, um, so at the end of the little discipline session, then you just say, okay, I would like you to ask forgiveness. Now, you all have parented long enough, you know the difference between a child that's broken and contrite versus one who's, I'm sorry. You know the difference. Okay, so let's pretend they're the I'm sorry guy. So they got the spanking in there, rigid and resistant. So you go and you get another witness. It's just, it's just, just loving that you have this agreement with your, with your spouse, husband or wife, whatever the case. You go and you make an appeal. Listen, I've had a situation with our loved one this day and doesn't seem to be working out that he really gets it. And I, I want you to approach him with me. And so you do, you do it together, daddy and mom together. Bringing the confrontation, listening to their side of the story, whatever. And then creating the verdict. Now, the beautiful thing that parenting can do is that you're not the boss, God is. You're standing in locus Deo. You're standing in the place of God. So you're realizing this kid's angel's right there watching. And I don't know if, if you and I can understand this, but while the angel's standing here watching us, this, the angel's face is right in the face of God. And so this is not a matter that you can just flippantly deal with. And your respect is for God. Now, I'll tell you what, the most powerful parenting encouragement I ever had was that when I remembered, oh, this isn't about me. I, I gotta give an account to God. And I don't wanna be like Eli, thank God for this story about Eli. I mean, I'm sad for the truth of it, but I'm also blessed by the correction of it. And G the Lord said to Eli, you didn't have the faith to restrain your sons. You didn't have the faith. Brothers and sisters, it takes faith to not to stay in your child, to stand in there as God's agent, bring him to that place. And so you go through it again. Now let's just say that 
This time, Daddy does the spanking. And there's no remorse, no repentance, stubbornness. Then what do you do? Well, you bring them to the church, which is not the local church. Bring the whole family together. Now, here's the amazing point that I never got until just this last couple weeks. Bring them to the whole family together. You make the appeal with all the children. All the children are recognizing what's going on. And you know what? Usually the other children realize when you're walking justly, they, they realize the justness of it. And they can say, please, please, relent, yield. But they still may be stubborn. And so, you know, you have, a, in my opinion, the, the very last spanking session of that occasion. And if they don't change, then you treat them like a pagan and a tax collector. How do you do that? By the way, we used to have this really cool book that told us told a story about a family, how they did that, how they had a, a, a son who wouldn't, or a daughter who wouldn't respond, and how they treated them. But um, that, that's a very graphic story. But let me just make a simple suggestion biblically from a practical standpoint. <clears throat> Two parts, your part. And this is the part that I wish I had understood because I could have just reveled in it as a, as a younger dad. I never did. First part is, you're, you're done. Now you just let it in the hands of God. And you say, okay, God, I've done my part. I, I love you, I respect you, I've done what I could, and I'm finished. I'm gonna back off because I'm not the final judge. And I just ask you, God, please work in this child's life. And you might even do that in prayer. In fact, I recommend that you do do it in prayer because that's the, the biblical model. And, and you might just say, Lord, I make my appeal. You're God, if I'm wrong, please show me, but this is the case, this is the account, and would you bring your hand of care and discipline over this child? And we, we take our hands off of him. Now what happens to you as you get to continue walking in the joy and the relationship with the Lord and the Holy Spirit filling you with, and you get to keep being you, and you've established the fact that this child has separated themselves from that close intimacy, because they've rejected that, and it's marked, but, but you're free. And that's the thing that is so important. You and I cannot afford to retain unresolved matters. It's got to be dealt with, done with, and finished. And if, and if it's a situation where it didn't finish well, you, you transfer it to God's care and you're done. And you're joyfully done. And you can't be accused by the enemy. And you can, and you can keep praying and you can keep hoping. And, you know, I, Lord, I, I, I don't know how to pray this, Lord, but do anything that you need to. Don't kill them. <laughs> you know, we're, we're tender hard. We, we want, but, but we do have that privilege. And you have no idea. That helps you be authentic. When you take that much time to deal with this, you know what you're dealing with? You're dealing with an eternal soul and you're worrying about eternity more than the temporal. You're taking the time to do it. And, and you're going to have a lot of positive success because the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord and your children, if you do it from their little, are going to learn how. And they're going to learn how to ask forgiveness. And so you move to the next thing. You have limited confrontation, unlimited forgiveness. Now, both of these two issues allow you to be totally a free vessel. Hebrews chapter 12 warns us about this thing called a root of bitterness. And what a root of bitterness is, it's an unresolved conflict that's never been resolved. And when you have never resolved a conflict, biblically, you have it present with you. And you know what happens with an unresolved conflict? You think, oh, I've, you know, forgiven, forgotten, whatever, until the next time. The next time, some little tiny thing happens, and you know what happens in your mind? Satan gets a hold of it, and you imagine all kinds of crazy things that aren't even close to being true. But that root of bitterness is the filter by which all that information passes. 
So it's imperative. So, you know, getting back to the prior slide, yeah, limit the confrontation because you've got to be done with it. You, you don't have the power to save your child. You don't have the power to have bring final judgment. So you bring them to the place where you finish and you're done and you go on. But when you're forgiving, <laughs> and this is what you'll get to do with your children again and again and again and again and again and again. And again. Forgive, 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 forgive. And the wonderful part about forgiveness is it absolutely is redemptive. When, when we um, raise our children with discipline, we use the rod to be the primary focus of instruction, of getting their attention so we could instruct. We, we didn't believe in things like punishment, like go to your room, stay there three hours, stand on your head in the corner. You know, and the main thing we didn't want that, that, that for was because we wanted things to be finished. So we would spank, hug, pray, and release. And you know what? When we did that, we never ever released an unhappy kid. And the, the hugging part, it was like you give the spanking and then the kid turns and just dives into your arm, sobbing, but a broken, happy heart. Incredible joy, joyful moment of parenting. And you just forgive again and again and again and again. And, and it's the standard. Now Jesus, you, if, you're a technical, if you're a technocrat, in Jesus' teaching, at one point Jesus said, forgive your brother if he says to you seven times in one day, I repent, you forgive him. And so here in this little situation, Peter gets smart. So how many times do we forgive him, Lord? Seven times? So he was using the prior teaching as a you know, ground rule. So after under eight, we can be permanently bitter. And he said, no, no, until 70 times seven. Now, what that means is, if you're counting, you never forgave once. Because love keeps no record of wrong. And usually somebody can't sin 490 times in a day. Pretty general terms. Always exceptions, I'm sure. <laughs> so, unlimited forgiveness. And what, what an amazing thing, though, because, uh, you know, just, just getting back to this whole picture, we start out with Harvard or heaven, and the reality is, you know, I, I, I'm raising kids for, for heaven. That's, that's my goal. And if my kids get to Harvard, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to grin. <laughs> I can't believe it. My kid went to Harvard. But it's going to be such a deep, profound joy because God did it. I didn't did it. Can you believe what God did? And that becomes part of your testimony. And you know what that happens? Other people here, you're rejoicing in God. And it sparks their interest. And they might be saved from it. So reality is, wow, the privilege we have as parents is to nurture souls for eternity. That's the primary task it occurs in every circumstance, every day, in every event. We're always dealing with the sin nature. The most imperative thing to recognize is, yep, you got one of those 99 that got lost. And yep, somehow all the years got that same disease. They're all lost. But rejoice, so are you. So is everybody around you. So it's the whole blessed purpose. God's not angry because we sin. He's angry because he won't let us fix it. That's all. God wants to fix the need we have. Let's pray. So Lord, we come in Jesus' name and we thank you. Thank you that you have chosen to make your dwelling place, your temple of the high and holy God in the hearts of broken and contrite sinners. Help us to teach our children to relax and enjoy the status that they're born with as sinners, for it qualifies them for that redemption.
that you've provided in Christ. Help us to lead the way with humility. Help us to have vision for who you are in our children. Not, that, not so that they're made in our image, but that your image that's in them might be manifest. And help us to pay the price to nurture our kids in every circumstance. Protect us from disdaining. And yes, Lord, uh, give that healthy dose of fear, recognizing that there's always a witness in the room who's holding your face at the very moment, that we're carrying out the privileged opportunity to be your caregiver. May you get the glory. May our children see you as we manifest your love and your care. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. Now, next, Joel.